Yeah, all right, stop all that. Let's go. Uh, but uh, what? This is. Oh, that's nice. I should do this more often in here. All right. So I don't have no fancy seminar. I'm not. I'm just like a regular old dude that just fishes, right? I catch a lot of bait. I do it as part of my living is to catch bait fish, specifically skipjack, shad, gizzard shad, threadfin shad, and moon eye. So. I got my bait bag up here and some of the things that I use. And that got really loud all of a sudden didn't it? when I turned this way. My fancy talk box is in the way or something. Uh, so feel free to come up here. I'm not like standoffish. I ain't nothing special. Just come up here. If you have a question about what I carry, what I use, how I use it, let me know. And uh, there's nothing secret in there. There's no like naked pictures. So feel free to dig around in there and make yourself home. This is a, it's just a bag. Uh, where do you guys want to start? We want to start with Skipjack? Yeah. Skipjack. Um, all right. So the Skipjack, we, I will start fishing for Skipjack probably next week. They're not going to be running real hard, but they're going to start running gradually depending on river conditions. Right now, we river conditions kind of not good. So, but we're, we're looking for the water temperature to be around 45. Once it is below 45, they slow way, way down. You can still catch them, but they're really slow. 45, 50, picks up a little bit. Over 50, we can start nailing it, depending on where you are and river conditions, of course. So, and anything that I'm telling you guys is nothing that I have come up with on my own. I just listen, like, I call them the OGs, is what I call them. Like, the guys have been doing it for a long time. That's the best resource. If you're fishing, on a river somewhere and you see some guy that's 85 years old been fishing that river for you know 85 years make buddies with him ask him questions he'll teach you a lot i've learned so much from like steve and doc and bank and all what i call the ogs has taught me enough about catching and handling bait to where i've been able to make a little bit of a bait business out of it and it's just listening so um sabiki rigs uh, jig heads with tubes and grubs, shiny heinies, and Rippin' Lips has uh, got a thing that's called the Jack'em Jigs, which uh, I've just now discovered and work really well. Any, any questions on like what rigs I use, how I tie my rigs, any of that kind of stuff before we get into anything? Foley spoons. Yes, I use a lot of Foley spoons. Yeah, I'm gonna get up and walk around because I can't hear real well. So, huh? That's all right. <laughs> so, the Foley spoon. Most of the time, when I use a Foley spoon, I'm using it at the end of a rig that I've made, whether it be a pre-made sabiki rig or a rig that I use myself. And I'll use a trolling sinker uh, between a half ounce or an ounce, depending on how fast the current is, with about a 12-inch leader at the end of that entire rig to make the flash. And. Uh, that works best for me as far as rigs. Now I have tried to use Foley spoons where I make like three or four of them in a line using three-way swivels and stuff. I can't get it to work. I've seen a couple of guys that's got it to work, kinda, but I have still not figured out a way to throw multiple spoons. I did see one dude have it like on a pre-made Alabama rig, you know, where they've got the big five things, and he did okay. He catch doubles, and I think he caught a triple, but you got that many skipjack. You know, when you're bringing them in, everybody knows how skipjack are. They're carrying on. It's kind of hard to, you know, to deal with them when they're all clustered like that. But Foley spoons, in my opinion, and I do use them single sometimes too. I'll just throw just a spoon on a leader behind a, 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 either a bobber or a, an inline trolling sinker or something like that. But yeah, I do a lot. So, uh, you got a question? Um. Well, the Sabikis, short answer, casting. Uh, casting. I mean, you, sometimes, like when I'm in my boat and I'm in a current, you can anchor up and you can just set them out there and long line them, yeah, and then planer boards and stuff and spread a whole bunch of, you know, baits out there at once. But yeah, I do, I have best luck um, when I'm fishing for a skipjack with a Sabiki rig, casting, and then as I'm reeling, kind of give it a little, little jerk like that. So, and those are on the, you know, and even on the rigs that I make myself, you know, we still cast them like that. So when I'm making a rig, when I'm using jig heads, I usually typically don't use anything over an eighth ounce jig head. And I'll make an eighth ounce jig head and I'll put it at the very bottom of my rig. And then I'll go another eighth ounce and then I'll go two or three sixteenth ounce in front of that. So if I have five hooks on a rig, 
The first two at the bottom are going to be eighth ounce. The next two are going to be sixteenth ounce. So that reason I do that is that when, when you cast it, the majority of the weight is at the bottom of the rig and it flies straighter, it casts better, and when it hits the water, it swims straight, and you get the heavier weights at the back, and you, it does this as you're bringing it in. It gives a little bit more action to your baits. And if you add a little bit of twitching motion in there, that's going to give you a lot of action. Because skipjack, even though we use them for bait, they're a predator fish. They're always looking for, you know, you guys know when you catch skipjack, they're full of minnows, they're full of little yellowtail shad, they're full of other fish. So they're looking, they're going to, they're going to be cruising when they're active, they're going to be cruising, you know, six, eight, ten feet of water, and their eyes kind of are orientated up. So they're looking between them and the surface tension of the water. So anything you can get to, that'll, you know, attract them is what we're looking for which is the reason why I really like, like shiny heinies and the jackham jigs because they have the shiny skirts on the jigs. And when those, those little thin pieces of shiny stuff, when they go under the water um, and the light from the water reflects off of those, it makes like a little bit more of a UV rainbowy glow type stuff underneath the water. Does that make sense? So that's what kind of gets attraction. And a lot of times you catch them when they're not feeding, you can get that reaction strike. You hear the bass guys talk about reaction strikes all the time. Skipjack are the same way. They may not be hungry, but you can tempt them enough to get a little bit of a reaction strike uh, by doing some other tricks. And I've even taken um, like the buzz baits, you know, for bass, where you bring them across the top of the water, they're going to, you know what I'm talking about? Those big blade on top water buzz baits and take one of those off of the buzz bait and put it onto a, the, top, the first part of a sabiki rig, throw the sabiki rig out there. And then as you're bringing it through, it's going and that sometimes when they're really hard to catch will give them enough incentive a little bit more excitement to come up see what's going on and then hit your bait from that so uh, another trick that I use sometimes is is everybody know what a popper float is the long the long floats that look like a cone so you could take one of those popper floats tie it onto the bottom of your either sabiki rig or your jig rig whatever you've made and then put a foley spoon off of the back of that then you cast out there your popper bobber will hit the water and you can just pop 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 and a lot of gets a lot of attention and we catch a lot of bass incidentally doing that too um like white bass and hybrids we catch a lot of bass just by that, having that big float out there and popping them the water it just it makes a big commotion and uh well we've had birds come down and find out what the hell's going on grab the bait and take off it's not good not fun but it happens it does happen so those are my main rig styles when i'm out fishing and i'm and i'm work fishing and i need to get uh, fish in the cooler as fast as I can. Those are the rigs that I use. I do use a lot of the sabikis, pre-made sabikis. I prefer the larger fly sabikis, uh, the ones that's got the larger flies, because I like to catch the, the skipjack that are 12, 14, 16 inches long. And uh, there's an old saying that I've learned from a lot of the old timers, uh, match the hatch. So the first skipjack that I catch, I usually will try to figure out what is, he, what is this skipjack eating? Because he's probably eating what all the rest of the skipjack are eating. So you can look inside their mouth. A lot of times you'll see a little tail or something you know, in their throat or a little bit of a shad or something. And I'll know right then and there, okay, well, I'm below Green at Bam and they're feeding on emerald shiners. What do I got that looks like emerald shiners? Or throw my little minnow net and catch emerald shiners and throw them out there, right? Uh, a lot of times below the Alabama, like Northern Alabama dams are feeding on the little yellowtail shad hatchlings. So what do we've got? We're matching, we're trying to match what they're already looking for as far as feeding goes. So keep that in mind. To match the hatch is a real thing. I have thrown, I fished about 300 days last year for skipjack. And I don't know how many different types and styles of baits I threw at them, but the ones that work most consistently for me uh, are like the Jack and Jigs, Shiny Heinies. Does anybody not know what a Shiny Heine is? Shiny Heinies, let me show you. Am I, uh, whoa, what is all that going on? All right. All right, so we have, I might have one here, a pre-made rigs. You wanna come up and see one? All right, Shiny Heinies, you can get them, they're made by Arky, a company called Arky out of Arkansas, I believe. And, uh, oh, rig wraps, if you guys don't use these, man, you are missing out, because you can have a week's worth of fish and stuff rigged up. All right, so Shiny Heinies, they're made by Arky. They're crappie jigs. They're made for crappie. So if you're looking for them, uh, I think Walmart carries a, a bunch of different types of them. My talk box quit. Where's the talk box guy? I broke it. I broke it. 
So can you hear me? All right. Uh, they come in a little red pouch. They're sold in twos. I think you can get them at Walmart. They're like a buck ninety-eight or something, or a pack roughly. And they have a whole bunch of different colors. But the reason they call them shiny heinies is because on the bottom of the jig itself, they've got these extra tinsel pieces that really glow under the water. And uh, they're a really, really good skipjack bait. Uh, it's the same thing with the, uh, the jack jigs. If I can find mine, they're somewhere around here. Cool. Typical tackle box, you can never find anything when you need it. But they're at the Rip and List booth. They're, they're pretty much like a shiny hiney, but they don't have the extension. And uh, we catch a lot of them on them too. This is what I was talking about, the popping floats. If anybody was, was curious, this style of float, this end up here has got a cone in it and it pops the water as it's going through. Um, and of course, pre-made sabiki rigs. So have I, anybody got any questions so far about anything? Jigs, jig heads, just your basic jig head with your tubes and your grubs and the whatnots that you thread on there. So if you have a spoon on the back of like a two shiny knife, mm -hmm. You know, that's a good question. I don't really know. I don't really know. I guess if you're throwing, if you're using one of the bigger Foley's, maybe. But what you got to remember is that Foley spoon as it's coming through the water is not only flashing, but it's displacing the water. And as it's doing that, it's making vibrations. And they have a lateral line, just like any other predator fish. They can feel it. They'll feel that vibration. So that may be what gets their extra attention, plus the extra flashy. They come to see what's flashing, then they see the bait, and they go for the bait. Or they just hit the spoon. I catch a lot of them on the spoons, too. So... Yeah, but you got to remember, they're predators. Just because we use them for bait, don't underestimate them. They're still a predator of fish. So think like, you know, you're looking for bass. You're looking for predators. What do they want? What do they eat? What attracts predator fish? Little fish. What do little fish do? They swim fast. They flash. They flash. They flash. They, you know, a bunch of them gets together. It makes a lot of vibrations. You know, they're jumping to the top of the water. So anytime you can pop stuff on the top of the water to get some extra attention, that's what we're looking at. Preference on colors. That's a good question. Believe it or not, it really depends on where you are. Um, if I'm up, say I'm on the Central Ohio River, Greenup, Meldal, those that stretch of river through there, they like chartreuse and white. That's what I've always done the best of. Now, if I get down like Kentucky Lake, Barkley area like there, they love pink and black and white. But that pink and black, I call them disco jigs. Huh? They just they look like a disco, you know. But they love them, man. They just tear them up. <laughs> you know, when Steve, Steve told me like just about an hour ago that this was actually going to be a bait talk. He told me on the phone I was supposed to get up here and do free rap for like half an hour. Freestyle rap. I'm like, uh, okay, I guess. So, okay, so are you good? Yeah. Good? Anybody else? Best line? Best time. time. Meaning time of year, time of day, all of the above? <coughs> Excuse me. Daylight. My opinion, I've always done really well right at daylight and right at dusk. In the spring and the early summer, when they're really pre spawning hard and spawning hard and they're feeding all day, you can catch them all day long. There are times when you can catch them at night. So, you're on the river, you're night fishing, right? You're catfishing. You notice that there is like a barge pylon or a barge dock that's got a permanent light on there all the time on the river. There might be skipjack there at night feeding because the light is gonna attract the smaller bait fish that are eating the bugs on top of the water. So you can catch them all day and all night, but you kinda gotta look for them a lot more at night. Uh, time of year, it, it just, a lot of it depends. Spring is really great, early summer is really great. The fall sometimes is really great. A lot of times it depends on river conditions, you know. It depends on how much water they're running. Uh, you know, if you're fishing below a dam, most people, all right, let's talk about that for a second too. Is that, is that okay for an answer for you? Are you dig what I'm saying? Everybody wants to fish below dams. And dams are great, don't get me wrong. We catch a lot of skipjack under dams because they love the current. They want to find those current scenes because the current scene, say you got, say you got a, a rock eddy going out like this and the river's running down and it's pushing that water together. All those little shiners, all those little shad, all those little bait fish are also getting compressed into that bait scene. So that's where you're going to find your predator fish sitting right there in that current scene, gobbling them up as they come through. So I lost my train of thought there for a second. Sorry. That's what, that's what we're aiming for. Is the uh, but you, you don't necessarily have to be below a dam to find that. 
boat ramps, bridges, rock eddies, just a rock pile out in the middle of the river. Anything that can create a current seam anywhere, you can find the bait fish that we're looking for. So some people will say, well, you can't, you can't catch skipjack unless you're below a dam. Oh, that's crap. You can catch skipjack anywhere in the river. You can catch skipjack in dead water locks if they're there. Right, Bink? I know that because Bink told me. That's the man right there. Bink is the man. Anybody know Bink Fox? Dude, I love Bink, but he is the pickiest dude when it comes to bait. When I bring him bait, I'm scared because I don't know whether or not I'm going to get a happy bink or kicked in the butt because my bait ain't right. So, <laughs> but yeah, so when you're out fishing, I, in my boat when I'm fishing, even I'm catfishing, even I'm in a tournament, I've got a bait rod in the boat. There's always a bait rod somewhere handy because you never know when you see that little going on. It may be out in the middle of the river. It may just be one school of 10 or 15 skipjack, but that's fresh bait right there. Bang, bang, bang. You're going to cast your lures, you're going to cast your jigs, you're going to cast a minnow, whatever it is you have with you, and see if you can't pluck a couple of them fresh ones out of there uh, because they're just, they're everywhere. A lot of times in the summer and the spring, since they are spawning, they do like to spawn in that current blow in the rocks and stuff, the dams, the dams are a place to go. A lot of times dams are easily accessible with walkways and fishing areas and stuff like that. So dams are the first place to look if you're, especially if you fish from the bank, you don't have access to a boat or something. The dams are a great place to go, but don't forget about boat ramps. Just because you don't have a boat doesn't mean you can't go to a boat ramp. So, any questions about any of that kind of stuff? Everybody good? I'm not boring the crap out of everybody. We're good still? Good. All right. Um, anybody have any other questions about skipjack or skipjack fishing? Why don't you go over how you handle it, how you care for it? I'm getting ready to go into that right now. All right. Now, the OGs, as I referred to them, like Bink, and Steve, and Chris Outers, and Doc Lang, after many, many, many failed attempts of bringing bait to them that were, was acceptable that they would use, bink, uh, <laughs> and having to take it home and redo everything, I've learned how I handle the bait and what makes the, it work for me, which is a saltwater ice slurry. Steve's got a video on this. I've got a video on this. Uh, I think Chris Souders has a video on it. Quentin Robbins has got a video on it. Have you guys made a video about it yet? Uh, so Team Fish, Harley Neal. Uh, we've got videos about how to handle bait. So we talked earlier about skipjack, eat a lot of minnows, little small fish, shad, stuff like that, right? Fish guts break stuff down very quickly, right? Their guts have got a lot of acid in them and a lot of digestive abilities. So as soon as that fish comes out of the water, it's automatically rotting from the inside out. Automatically, just like that. Because it's already in the process of breaking down all the other little fish that it's eaten. So if you don't get that fish chilled and cooled as quick as possible, pretty soon that fish is gonna die. There's gonna be a little bit of those fluids leaked from the guts of that fish, and it's gonna start tearing the inside of that fish up, making it soft, which does not make good bait. You don't want that, you don't want that to happen. So, what I do is when I get my, when I'm ready to go out, I will take my cooler, I'll fill it up about three fourths away with ice, and then I, I carry a salt uh, called Mix and Fine that I get from Tractor Supply. It's a real fine mix of salt. And I put, um, I don't know, maybe a pound, a pound and a half in my cooler, and then I fill it up with water, and I run my hands in it. I run my hands in it because I want it to hurt my hands when I put my hands in that water. If it doesn't hurt, it's not cold enough, put a little more salt in there. Right, mix it up. And then as soon as you take them fish off the hook, they go straight in there. And you know, most of the time you can just put them in there and they just swim down in there themselves, right? And that starts them chilling. That's the, that's the fastest, most efficient way that I've found to get them cool and preserved, right? So then we leave them sitting there uh, until you fish. You fish, a lot of times the fish will come in spurts, 15, 20 minutes worth of catching stuff. You stop, you pull them out of that slurry solution and start packing them on ice and I will pack them with the back down and the stomach up and then put ice all around them. That way it helps keep all the blood and all the, the oils and stuff like that into the back of the fish where the spinal cord is because that's what most of us are going to be using those chunks and flakes and stuff like that for bait. We don't want it running out through their nether region of fish, you know. We don't want, we don't want to lose any of that good stuff. And at the same time, we don't want any of uh, the, uh, the like the dead decomposing fish inside to be causing any kind of trouble. So I stack them uh, in my cooler and then cover them with ice 
put a little bit of salt on that layer of ice, and then I can start my next layer of, of fish. So, is that, everybody, everybody understand that? What kind of salt did you say you uh, It's called mix and fine. It's, uh, it's a feed, it's a feed salt that uh, you add uh, for animal feed. And I get mine at Tractor Supply, and I think it's like seven bucks for a 40, 40 pound bag. Huh? Non-iodized. Yeah, non-iodized. I use non-iodized. If you're going to use regular salt, I wouldn't use the iodized. Not that it's going to hurt it any, but it's got iodine in it, so there's a chance there could be some off-color coming from it. So. Well, yeah, it dissolves easier. The, the fine salt dissolves easier in the water, whereas a big chunks of rock salt, it may be cheaper, but it's going to take a little more work to get it dissolved. And another thing is, is when you pull the fish out of the brine solution, Especially like when you go to pack it, I always wipe them off because I don't want a lot of that extra salt stuck on the fish before I freeze it. And we'll get to that in a second. So that's what I do. I bring them out, I take them off the hook, I put them straight into a saltwater slurry until they're dead. Um, and then they'll stay in there for 15, 20, 25 minutes. And then when you get a chance, pull them out, take them to a separate cooler, stack them on their back, cover them in ice, cover that layer of ice in salt. All right, we good so far? Anybody? All right, so we've got a cooler full of fresh, wonderful, preserved skipjack now, right? We're coming off the river, we've got our cooler. We take our cooler home. We're gonna preserve this fish for the, the next month or so as we're the fishing. You've got 50 or 60 skipjack, you wanna keep them as fresh as you can until you're ready to use them. I take my fish home, I rinse them, I dry them, and then I put them in a vacuum seal bag and I vacuum seal them, okay? I rinse them, I dry them, and then I vacuum seal. Or I don't vacuum, and I hope that Bink doesn't get mad when I bring him his fish. So, yeah, am I, am I good so far? All right, I'm just trying to remember what I've been taught. <laughs> Where's Doc at? He needs to be over here too, because he knows a lot about it. No, I, I wash them and I wipe them dry. I want them dry when I put them in the bag. Um, because when you freeze them, any kind of extra moisture that's on the outside of them is going to freeze and make crystals. And those ice crystals are going to puncture the skin. And that's when you start getting issues with frostbite. And then when you thaw them, a lot of the oil and the natural juices inside of the fish are going to come through the skin. I, that's just what I do. And that's what I do for the guys that I do bait for. So that, that's just what works for us. That, that, to my opinion, I mean, I know a lot of guys like to keep the slime on them before they freeze them. But then when you pull it out, and you, and you saw it, you had all that extra slime in the bag, and it just, I just, for me, it's not, I mean, if you want to keep the slime on, do your thing, man, do your thing. For me, I like them clean and dry and then frozen. And then we vacuum seal them, and I don't let the vacuum sealer run the whole cycle. I don't let them pull any of the blood out. As soon as the bag is uh, air free, then I seal it. Because if you keep running that vacuum on there, then it's gonna start pulling stuff out of the fish. Uh, that you want to keep in the fish, like the blood around the gills and stuff. If you, you guys ever vacuum seal your shad and you see the blood coming out of the guts and stuff, well, you want to turn your sealer off before it gets to that point and seal it before you get to that point. So as soon as your bag gets tight and sucks around the fish, seal it. All right? Now, after you have vacuum sealed your fish, you put it in the freezer, you got nice, big, beautiful stacks of frozen skipjack in your freezer, you're ready to go for the summer. So I'm going to go fishing day after tomorrow, so I'm going to pull some of this bait out and get it ready. I pull my vacuum sealed fish out of the freezer. First thing I do is I cut a corner of the bag off or poke a big hole in it. You don't want your fish to thaw under the vacuum because again, as it starts to thaw, it'll start pulling the blood, the oil and all that stuff. It'll pull it right out of the fish as it's thawing under the vacuum. Okay, everybody, mean, everybody know what I mean? Poke a hole in your bag and let air in it as you're thawing it and thaw it slowly. I would not recommend throwing it under hot water, leaving it in the sun and then like that. If you know you're going to go fishing on Saturday, pull your bait out on Thursday. Cut a corner of your bag off, either put it in a cooler with ice or put it in your refrigerator someplace like that where it can thaw gradually. Because if you speed up the, the natural process of thawing, you're going to damage the bait and it's going to start pulling more, more oils and more blood and all that kind of stuff out of the fish. And if it's got a ruptured gut on it and you thaw it under a vacuum and that fish has got a ruptured gut, all that digestive juices from this gut is gonna thaw out, get all through the bag, and then the entire fish is gonna be covered and be breaking down. And then you're gonna have people talk about your bait is really soft. 
a lot of guys when they cut the corner or they thaw their fish under a vacuum, they don't, they don't poke a hole in that bag. They get soft bait and that's the reason why, in my opinion, I'm not a fishiologist, right? I'm just a dude that messes with a lot of bait. But in my opinion, the reason that that becomes real soft a lot quicker is because the juices, the digestive system of the fish, you know, the acids are so potent that as you're thawing that fish under a vacuum, it pulls it all out of the fish, spreads it all through the bag. You know, I, you guys have seen stuff that's been thawed out, like steaks and stuff under a vacuum. It spreads all that blood everywhere when it's thawed. Well, the fish does the same thing. And now you got a fish that's covered in stuff that is designed to break down fish. All right, does that make sense? Everybody have any questions? Bank, is that, would you say that's a true statement? I'm gonna, dude, I'm gonna pick your brain while we're here because you know a lot, right? That's a good point too, yeah. Bank won't take a fish if his eyes ain't clear. If he's got cloudy eyes, Bank's gonna return it and he's gonna kick you in the butt. I'm just saying, if you guys ever wanna sell bait to Bank, this is what he looks for. <laughs> so you can tell if something has been in the freezer way too long, the eyes are gonna be cloudy. If it hasn't been handled correctly, the eyes are gonna be cloudy. I'm not saying there's gonna be times when the eyes are gonna cloud up, you can't avoid it. Sometimes they just, you know, you may catch a fish that's got a blind eye and that eye's gonna be cloudy. But a lot of the times, if you're looking at skipjack, you want to like to see the eye clear. That usually will mean that it's been handled pretty well and it's been preserved pretty well. Which is like, you, a lot of that can be took care of just by putting it into the salt slurry solution and chilling it really quickly. Yep, yes, yep, very good. We're good so far. Any other questions about skipjack? How long can we keep them for? I have used bait that I've kept in my freezer for seven months and still caught fish. So they're still, they're not gonna be as bloody, but they're gonna be, they're gonna be decent bait. Huh? No, not, not super mushy, no. Not real mushy, no. They won't be real mushy. If you handle it correctly in the beginning and you freeze it and you handle it properly, it'll last a long time. It'll last a long time. Do you find the mushiness more of a problem when you're casting or fish don't like the I'm sorry, go ahead, say that again? When they get mushy, is it more of a problem with them coming off while you're casting, or the fish, the fish don't like it? Okay, uh, he said the question is, is when the fish does get mushy, does it come off of the hook more as you're casting it or when it hits the water? Well, if you got mushy fish, uh, it will come off when you cast, but the water is going to continue to break it down, especially if you're in current, and that piece of bait's in the current doing this, right. it's going to just keep separating, coming apart, coming apart, coming apart, right. and... Yes, yeah. The catfish do care. They, it, better bait will make a difference in the amount and the quality of fish that you catch. That's why a lot of the tournament guys and the OGs, as I call them, are so picky about their bait because it does make a difference. It does make a difference. Um, now, smack dab in the middle of winter time, you're using whatever you can use. They'll hit it. They'll find it. They'll eat it. You know, that's what they're looking for. But yeah, if you're, especially if you're competitive fishing, you really need you really need good, good handled fresh bait. It does make a difference. It does make a difference. Because mushy bait will leave a cloud, right, for the first couple of minutes and it's in the water. But then that's all that that piece of bait's got to offer. And then you just got a chunk of nothing but skin and nothing left. There's no oil, there's no blood. And it's just there. And you're hoping for the best, you know. So, and we, you got to have good bait. I've thrown several times, I've thrown hooks out there with nothing on them, trying to fish on credit. But my credit must suck, so you got to have bait. I've never been able to catch fish on credit. So, but yeah, and if, like I say, if you, if you handle it good and you freeze it well and you thaw it properly, it'll last and it'll be a good bait for a good long time. Anybody else? Any questions? Skipjack? Fishing? Everybody can catch them skipjack now? Everybody can preserve them and freeze them now? No questions? All right, you guys are awesome. All right, what am I talking about next? Gizzard Chad? Gizzard Chad. All right, what we need to know about gizzard shad. Gizzard shad, I uh, find them a lot below dams as well. Uh, I also find them up in the calm water of creeks, around boat ramps, uh, any place that there's algae. They're, 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 gizzard shad actually have a gizzard inside them. They break down their grazers. They will grow uh, on the rocks, on concrete slabs, and they feed on the algae that grows on, on those particular stuff, up in the creeks and stuff like that. Anywhere there's algae, there's going to be shad feeding on them. And I've never caught a shad on a rod in real life, snagged a couple with a speaky rig, but usually I'm throwing a cast net. 
Uh, I think Chris Souders did a thing earlier on how to throw a cast net. Uh, but that's what I do. And I handle my shad the same exact way that I handle my skipjack. When I bring my cast net in, I empty my cast net into the, the saltwater brine slurry solution that we talked about with the ice and the salt in the water. And then I push them down in there because I want to chill them. Shad break down even faster than skipjack do. So if it's really hot and you bring them in, you put them in a bucket, they're going to be, they're going to start rotting very quickly and they break down very quickly. Now, if you're just going to go, say you're catching shad to go fishing tonight, you're, you're fine. All right. This, this is what I'm talking. I'm talking about catching bait to use down the road. So you're, you're catching bait in the spring to use in the fall or at the end of summer. Right. <clears throat> so, uh, shad, like I said, we're going to, we're looking around the boat ramps. Uh, the concrete slabs, you know, the boat ramps as they go in, they grow a lot of algae. We all seen slip, everybody slipping and sliding on them. Shatter feeding on those, shatter feeding on rocks below dams. <coughs> Excuse me. Shatter up in the backwaters of the creeks, slack waters. So, and it's just one of them things that uh, you can use your you can use your, your your electronics to find bait balls and stuff like that pretty easily as well. I forgot to mention that about skipjack. Skipjack will kind of look like crop. Anybody seen crappie under fish finders? The little small arches that really are really, really shiny. Because the shiny, I guess, is the scales, I think, on them. There's real shiny stuff. So you see a great big little bee, you know, a great big ball of little bee. That's usually going to be a school skipjack, and you can sit there and pluck some out that way. I've gotten lucky like that a few times. But anyway, that's, that's how we, and you can find shad the same way, too. Just cruise real slow up a creek, and use your electronics. You'll see a bait ball. You can hit it with a net. because shad breaks down really, really quickly. And a lot of people don't take the time when they're handling their shad to really take care of it properly. You know, they don't, they don't, they'll put it in the bucket, they'll throw it on the floor of the boat, you know, they'll fill their boat up and go home with 10,000 shad that are just rotting on the bottom of the boat. That's why a lot of the guys, especially tournament guys, they, they'll rather go catch their fresh shad the morning that they go fishing rather than taking a chance on getting stuff that hasn't been handled correctly. That's why, you know, I take, when I pull my, when I pull my net in, they go straight into the saltwater slurry and then I fish them out and put them into a, a, a regular cooler. Now, I don't take the time to stack each individual shad on its back like I do my skipjack. Uh, I just layer them in a cooler with ice because, you know, when you get on a school of shad, I mean, you guys have seen there's netfuls of shad. You'll be there all day trying to stack each of them, you know, a little fish up stuff. So, but yeah, I still handle them the same way as what we would do with the skipjack. So, any questions on shad? Shad's pretty self-explanatory and easy. Uh, you either find them or you don't. It's been kind of rough finding them here lately, but when you do find them and you got some in your cast net, I would treat them the same way that I would treat any other bait that I'm dealing with. So where would be a great, great place right now to, to hunt for the shad? The <laughs> Backwaters of the creeks is where I'd be right now. If I was looking for a lot of numbers of shad, I'd be in the creeks, up creeks ways in the backwaters, around bridges, brush piles, stuff like that is where I'd start looking for them. I'm not gonna throw my net into a brush pile, but if they're shad around, sometimes you can go close with your boat, kind of flush them out of there a little bit like rabbits, you know, flush them out and then try to get them on, get a net on them. That's where I would be. Now here in about a month or so, when the water starts warming up and they start pre-spawning and spawning, they're gonna be below dams in areas that's got a little bit more current. My understanding, again, I'm not a fishiologist, I'm just a dude who looks for fish. So, but that's my experience. So a lot, that's why you see a lot of guys below the dams be throwing their cast nets trying to catch shad. Uh, that are coming in and schooling up along the rocks and stuff. So, yep, we're good. Any questions, Shad? All right, moving on to the last fish that I that I work with personally. It was just called Moon Eye, not Gold Eye, Moon Eye. Uh, and I don't have a, a picture. I mean, you guys can get on your your iPhone talk box thing and look for a picture of a Moon Eye. Um, moon Eye are a herring that is, is that's just a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful bait. Um, they've got a mouthful of teeth, so you don't want to lip them, and they got real big silver eyes. They do have a close relative called the gold eye, which I believe in Ohio is on the endangered species list. You can't catch them or mess with them. But uh, there's other states, if you catch a gold eye, you can use it for bait. But the moon eye will have the silver eye instead of the gold eye. So better safe than sorry, in my opinion. If you catch one, if you catch something that looks like a shad, it's got a mouthful of teeth and a gold eye, I would put it back before somebody with a badge comes up and makes a bunch of tickets. Right. So, moon eye looks like a shad with a mouthful of teeth, a silver eye, and they're bug eaters. They eat bugs. 
So what I'm looking for when I go fishing for moon eye is they like current. They like skipjacking or they like current. And they like areas where like a below a dam, I catch a lot of them below green up dam. Now the reason is because every dam has got that little trash spillway, right? Everything's got a little trash spillway. There's gonna be warm rocks. There's gonna be stuff coming through the turbines. There's usually a lot of bugs in that area, dead bugs coming over the dam, coming through the turbines. I know my favorite bait is crickets. Crickets, and I've caught them on wax worms and mealworms, but for me, crickets work the best. Uh, and I will just simply find me a little current seam that I think might have some moon eye hold up in it. I'll flip my cricket up river just a little bit in the current and let it float down through the current seam. And if they're there, it doesn't take long and you'll, your bobber will go down. I use pretty much a bluegill rig. I've got a bobber and then uh, depending on the depth of the water, usually I've got maybe three, three and a half feet of line with just a little gold hook, maybe a, maybe a split shot sinker, a cricket, flip it out there in the current, let it float down the current and see if there's anything in there. If the moon eye are in that current scene, you throw a cricket out there, you're going to catch them. They're hard to get a hook in, though. They'll, they're, and they clean that hook off quick, and they, they hit fast, and if you don't get a hook on them, they're, they're gone, and you got to rebate because they're, they're pretty quick. So, and again, as far as the handling them after I catch them, I do them the same exact way I do shad and skipjack. They go straight to a cooler that's got uh, saltwater slurry, ice, so on and so forth. Uh, but those, in my opinion, especially in the summertime, is an, just an excellent, excellent catfish bait. Do you think they break down faster than shad even? I'm sorry? Do you think they break down even faster than shad? I think they do. Moon eye? I don't know. They break down quickly. I don't know. Well, I mean, that may be something that somebody can do at some point is uh, kind of do a test what breaks down the quickest. But yeah, moon eye will break down because they're real thin. They mostly got a thin body and they, they'll break down pretty quickly. I don't know if they break down faster than shad. But yeah, you need, to, you need to make sure your hand, again, unless you're just gonna go fishing in the next couple of hours, you know, and I would still put them on ice then anyway. But yeah, I would, yeah, they break down very quickly. So that's the, that's the reason for the slurry. But yeah, again, I don't know. That might be an interesting experiment to see which one breaks down the fastest, you know, shatter, yeah. There you go, make a video there, Uncle Harley. Hey, Lonnie, put, put the, uh, the moon eye, do they, are they meat eaters as well? Mouthful of teeth? I have never caught them on anything other than a bug, uh, either like a, 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 a wax worm, a mealworm, crickets. I think they're, I think they're primarily bug eaters. Um, I have heard of some dudes say they've caught some on minnows before, and that may be true. I personally have never caught one on a minnow. Sometimes I'll float shiners down the same way for skipjack. I've never caught a moon eye on a minnow, uh, but I have caught them. I mean, they, they tear them crickets up. So. I'm sorry? Um, well, moon eye can get pretty big. So if you get a great big honker, then you're probably gonna cut it up. But the average, you know, eight, 10, depending on how big of a fish you're catching, what size rig you're using, yeah. Yeah, sometimes you can just like clip the little thin part of the tail and put the whole thing out there whole or use it whole. Uh, if you can keep them alive, which they're really hard to keep alive, even if you put them in a live bait well or something like that. Uh, I'm sure they would be an awesome live bait if you can keep them alive. Have you ever used them live bait? Yeah. Yeah, are they? There you have it. Yeah. I, me personally, when I'm catfishing and I'm using moon eye for bait, I usually cut them chunks or, you know, slide a fillet off of, you know, slide a fillet off one of them and use the, you know, the backbone for blood and stuff like that. But yeah, that's, uh, and moon eye, there's not a whole lot of play. I know they're in the Ohio and I know they're in the Mississippi. Uh, there's a few that I've caught out of the Tennessee, but I haven't caught the numbers out of the Tennessee River or the Cumberland River that I have like out of the Ohio and the Mississippi River. So I think most of the tributaries of the Mississippi will have them, but being able to find them in larger numbers, that's something that you're just going to have to kind of hit the water and explore in your, in your area to see, um, to see if there's moon eye, you know, plentiful around there. Shad is everywhere. And uh, again, skipjacks are in most of the tributaries of the uh, Mississippi and Ohio River as well. So, anything, any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, skipjack? Yeah, I have. And uh, I failed miserably, by the way, doing that. They're really hard. There's, there's a couple of guys that I know can keep them alive, but I don't know their tricks on how they do it. They can keep them alive, not for a real long time. Not for a really, really long time,
but they can't keep them alive for a while. I know Chris Sowers has kept uh, has kept several alive for quite a long time in extreme bait tanks, um, but not. It's not like an all day or two or three day thing. They're, they're going to die eventually, in there. So, but I've tried all kinds of stuff with my little rigs and my little pools, and I've had hoses and aerators, and I'm like, man, that's going to work. And then I go out there like seven minutes later, and they're all dead floating. I'm like, what the? Come on, you know, it's just it's, they're 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 just hard to keep alive. They're hard to keep alive. So, and some things, as much as we love the OGs, and as much as they teach us, and as much as we, I mean, I'm always listening. Like you have, I'll have Doc and Steve, or Doc and Bink, and they're just like talking, right? They're just over having a conversation, and I'm like, because you know they're gonna slip up and say something new, right? But they never share all of their secrets. They never share all of them. There are certain things that they do that they just ain't gonna tell us quite yet. So, you know, it is what it is. Uh, but that's, you know, that's, that's, that, that's that way that I catch and handle the bait. And again, I, I do it as part of my living. Uh, I take pride in my bait because I work really hard, not only to catch it, but to take care of it. You know, bring it home, clean it and freeze it. To, to that, way, that way, if you're in a bait shop and you buy uh, some bait that I provided for that shop, I'm trying to make sure that I have the best fish in there that you guys, that I could, that I could provide for you guys. You know, I want, I will go in there and get my fish and use it for bait because I'm comfortable. You know, I'm not going to sell mushy, crappy bait because I, if I wouldn't use it, I won't put it out there for you guys to use. So that's just, I mean, and I do the best that I can. I mean, I'm not saying that I do it perfectly every time. I'm not saying that my stuff is the end all be all of all bait. You know, it's just, I do the best that I can. Harley's been on a bait run with me. You liked it, Harley, didn't you? He's ready to go again. Because I don't sleep. When I, when I leave out on a bait run, I do not sleep until I am back home, the fish are taken care of, packed in the freezer, and everything's cleaned up. And then sometimes that's three or four days that I will go without stopping to make sure that I can put the very best product that I can out there. And it just is what it is. It caught up with me at the end of last year and I paid for it. But that's what I do. And there's been a couple of guys that have gone on bait runs. Well, I can do that. I'll go with you. I'll go with you. And uh, what? We got back to the driveway and Harley was gone. All I saw was taillights. He was just in his truck, pew, gone. He, 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 and we started out, he's like, oh man, I'm going to help you fish. We'll get home. We'll clean them. I'll we'll help you unload the coolers, blah, blah, pew, gone. So it's a lot of work. You know, it's a lot of work, but uh, it, it is what it is. I, I enjoy doing it. I enjoy it, except when it's 117 degrees in Alabama. I don't enjoy that, but uh, most of the other time I do it. And I, I don't mind doing the extra step to make sure that, that uh, you know, that my customers have got a, a, a good quality bait. Like I said, I'm not the end all be all. Uh, my bait is not the only bait that you're gonna catch fish on or the best bait in the world, but I do the best that I can with what I have. So, and I hope everything that I've said has made sense. I hope everybody is uh, better now at catching and preserving bait. Does anybody have any more questions about anything? Yeah, man. <laughs> Mono, floral, or braid. <coughs> Excuse me. All of the above. Where are you fishing? What are you fishing for? I don't use braid when I'm fishing moon eye because they got all them teeth and it doesn't take long for it to, to, to fray out and break. Um, I use a lot of mono uh, for my leader lines. And I use, all right, so I'm fishing, I'm work fishing, right? I'm not play fishing, I'm working. I've got planer boards out, I've got rod holders full of my rods, and I'm using big catfish gear. I'm catching bait, but I'm using my big stuff, right? I'm serious fishing. I'll have six rods out the back of the boat. Two of them I have planer boards as a spread, and four of them will be spread out through the back. My main line off my reel is gonna be braid because there's no play in it. I can get them fish in, get them off, get them in the cooler, get the lines back out. My leader, where my baits are, is gonna be mono. Unless I'm fishing moon eye, a lot of times when I'm fishing moon eye, I'll use my fluorocarbon leader because it takes abrasiveness a little bit better, especially if they get into the rocks. So that's what I'm, that's what I use on mono. And then my leader for my Foley spoon is going to be mono as well. So yeah, but yeah, and that's, that's something else I forgot to, to talk about a little bit. It was my set of, like, so I find, an, I find a nice looking current seam in the river. I drop an anchor, I set my boat up, my boat's in the current, and I spread it. I'll, there's sometimes I'll have 36 baits out there, but there's also times when you know, I got two or three rods bouncing with fish on them. I get one reeled in, get the fish off, get the lines back out. And just, you just work them like that to get, get as much as you can in a short period of time. And I'm using my big catfishing stuff. I look like I'm catfishing. I have planter boards out and bobbers and popping and uh, yeah. And 
the, some of the stuff that I use, I've got up here, like I use clear boards. These clear boards right here, this is what I run on my boat. Uh, and the reason is because I went through probably, let's see, I started using clear boards last year. And the year before that, I think I went through six different sets of boards because they broke. I, I'm really, really hard on my gear. I, I don't, I don't, I expect my gear to be kind of as tough as I am. And so my boards kept breaking. Uh, these things here, they ha I have not, I, all right, I'm not admitting anything, but you can get these wrapped up and they'll be blah, 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 off the prop and you're on your boat and bottom of your boat and it won't break. <laughs> it's still kicking. So, and like I said, I'm not admitting anything. That wasn't me, but I know a guy that knew a guy who happened to run over one of his own planer boards one day. <laughs> Yeah, so not sleeping has its downfalls, but, but yeah, so I run planer boards uh, and I run bobbers and that's something that I learned from Doc over there, uh, was running planer boards to help get you a bigger spread. And the benefit too of the planer board is you know, that board, you guys have seen the planer boards in the water, how the water current's jerking them. Well, sorry, so you got a, a six foot line of baits out behind that. Every time that planer board goes like this in the current, well, it goes through that line of baits and it does this, it gives them a little more action. So that really draws a lot of attention. And I catch a crap load of fish on them planer boards, bait fish. And then I can just unclip my sabiki rig, clip on my catfish stuff, send the planer board right back out and start catfishing. So um, uh, you can also use planer boards from the bank. I made a video a couple months back uh, about using a planer board from the bank. Um, and the reason that I got interested in that, again, Doc filled me in on that. I was fishing below Meldal, the Meldal Dam one time. And I was fishing a current seam trying to catch skipjack and there just wasn't any skipjack in the seam that I could reach while I was casting. They were all in another seam out in the middle of the river and I couldn't cast my little light jigs that far. I just couldn't, not without putting like seven ounces of weight on. And then you gotta cast seven ounces of weight. So Doc said, well, why don't you just put a planer board on there? I was like, oh, that's brilliant, that's brilliant. So what I did was I clipped my planer board right at the very tippy top of my sabiki rig or my jig rig, whatever it was that I was using, right at the top of it, and just flip it out into the current seam. And then let the planer board do what the planer boards do, and take it out, right out to the, and by golly, it went straight out to the middle of the river. I clicked my bale on my reel, that planer board stayed out there with that current seam, and the, the skipjack loaded it up on them, and that's how I was bringing them in. And I was the only person that day that could get to the current seam where the skipjack were, because I had a planer board with me that I could use to take it out further than what I could cast it. Does that make sense? Everybody dig what I'm saying when it comes to that? So we have all these tools available for catching catfish. We need to be thinking outside the box and using them for other things as well. And I, I'll tell you, as incidental catches, I catch a lot of crappie, white bass, hybrid. Harley, how many white bass did we catch that day? A hundred at least. I mean, I mean, we put them back in the water as well. But yeah, it was a, we catch a lot of fish using these other little techniques like, you know, planer boards and the popping bobbers and stuff like that. We, we catch a lot, we catch a lot. So one more thing that I will ask, and I know when we're all under pressure, especially if there's a tournament, it's, it's Thursday, you got a tournament on Saturday, you're stressed out with bait, you're catching bait. I would ask if you catch large female shad, large female moon eye, large female, skipjack they're obviously full of eggs you can test you squeeze the belly a little bit you see an egg come out please put her back let her go let her go do what she's supposed to do and make more bait for next year i see guys that are taking the dinky little bitty skipjacks bucketfuls at a time they're not going to use them they end up rotting and that's just a waste and we need to the the bait fish are just as much a resource as our catfish are because we got to have those bait fish we got to have them. so if you catch a really large skipjack Take a picture of it like you would anything else. Man, look at this jack. Put her back in and let her go make more little skipjack because that's how we're gonna keep being able to keep catfishing is to have good bait. So my last question, what is the weirdest thing you guys have used for bait and been successful with? Oh man, you really? <laughs> Anybody? I learned. Turkey heart, yeah, right, yeah, yeah, turkey heart. Uh, we all deer hunt. Deer hearts, deer livers. If you don't eat the hearts and livers, which I do, but what I don't use a lot of is like, you know, the forearms or the calf parts of the deer, which is really tough, full of a lot of sinew and silver skin. A lot of guys, sometimes I'll can them or stew them because they're really flavorful, but they're excellent 
catfish bait. If you're fishing for eaters, you know, the big blue, I've never caught a great big blue, but eight, nine, ten pounders, you put a couple of chunks of that calf meat on there, hook it through that silver skin where it stays on the hook, they love them. Love them! Uh-huh. Right, yep. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. Big chunks of meat. Mm -hmm. Yep, garlic herb meat. I see a lot of guys using uh, like when we're shadow cat fishing, we'll use those garlic and herb shrimp, thaw them out, put them on the hook, they they work really well. But yeah, I this is something I just learned last fall from an old timer about using deer meat. Because we he just got through butchering his deer. And he was throwing stuff in a bag, setting it aside. And I'm like, are you going to grind that up to hamburger? He's like, no, no, I'm going to catch catfish with that. I was like, what? He's like, yeah, man, let me, sit down, Scooter. Let me teach you something. I was like, okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, yeah. So that's the best way to learn. If, you need, if, you're, if, you, if you're fishing an area and you're struggling and you see somebody with gray hair who's catching fish, <laughs> hello, sir. How are you today? Oh, I'm great. Thanks for asking. Hey, uh, can I ask, what the heck are you doing over here? Because you're, you're wearing them out. So when the old timers talk, listen, because they know what you're talking about. And I'm not an old timer and I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm just relaying what has been taught to me uh, over the past several years from other people that I fish with and uh, especially get bait for. Because bait is very important, very important. You're gonna catch better quality fish and more fish if you have a better quality bait versus something that's nasty and mushy and frostbit so are we good anybody have any more questions anything i forgot to cover bink no doc anything i forgot to cover anything you'd like to add anything you'd like for me to add yeah, good. did i do good yeah. doc said i did good Woo. i'm sorry mine 76 yeah i can't i can't bust the 70s but i will and i'm gonna do it with him because he promised me the other day, he says, I'm going to take you out on the boat next Wednesday, and I guarantee you're going to catch a 100-pounder. That's what he told me. <laughs> yes, sir. Ah, good question. All right. That question was, when you thaw out your skipjack and you're ready to cut it up for bait, do you cut the gut pocket out and just use the back, or do you keep the gut pocket on and use the gut pocket? Well, it all depends on who you ask. Or for me, it depends on what kind of river conditions I'm in. If I'm fishing a real heavy, fast current, the gut pocket's coming off. Because eventually those guts are gonna come out of that gut pocket and that bait's gonna sit down there and go like this. And if you're not using a good quality swivel, it's just gonna get wrapped up and become a gigantic pain in the butt to get out. So gut pocket up. But if I'm fishing slack water or calm or water, it's not so much current. Me personally, I leave the gut pocket on and I'll run my hook through the guts, up through the belly meat, and then I'll use it like that. Mr. Douglas over here, on the other hand, as soon as he pulls that skipjack out of the cooler, <laughs> gut pocket comes off. Yeah, yeah. It's a, and a lot of it's just personal preference. You know, some guys want it, some guys don't. Uh, Chris Souders is the one that I learned, you know, hooking it upside down through the guts to try to keep them guts on there, but we weren't fishing in very much current. Again, if you got a lot of current, that gut pocket's gonna hollow out and it just spins because it's just a tube of meat start spinning. What do you say, Bink? Gut pocket or no gut pocket? Ah, there's another one. Uh, and we all know Steve because of his videos. He's, he's a no gut. What do you think, Uncle Harley? Oh, we got it depends. What do you say? Gut pocket, no gut pocket? Ah, uh, there you go. Both, both gut. Huh? Oh, there's a gut pocket guy too. All right. Yeah, gut pockets. Gut pockets. There's another gut pocket. All right. Guys, anything else I can do for you? Anybody have any questions, comments, concerns? Yes, sir. All right. We are Doc Lang is going to come up. What's he talking about? Oh, that ought to be good. Doc Lang, where's Doc? He's gonna come up and talk channel cat fishing. Does everybody know Doc Lang? Man, Doc is the man. Doc's been fishing, I think for this year, what, it's 117 years? 
But he's been catching catfish. He's been at it a long time, and the guy knows so much about fishing. I've learned so much from him. And he's gonna come up here at four o'clock and do the channel cat talk. And uh, I don't think he could fit all the catfish that he's caught in this building. The guy is just amazing. He's, he's, a, he's an OG. He's an original, one of the original guys. And uh, he, he, he knows so much, it's just unbelievable. So he's like EF Hutton. When Doc talks, people listen. Am I that, does anybody else remember those commercials? Am I too old? No? Yeah, you remember. <laughs> All right. Yeah, we ready to go? Are we gonna switch this over? I gotta give Doc the talk box now, right? Look at it. See, Doc's all fancy. I bring, if you guys wanna look at my gear, feel free. Come up here, check out my tackle bag. Uh, I, just, I just picked up my rig wrap rig pack, which I'm gonna use it because it's gonna come in really handy. But this is my stuff. Feel free to dig around, look at my jigs, look at my boards, look at whatever it is that you want to look at. It's an open book. Dig around in there, man. It's a typical tackle bag, so there might be hooks laying around. I'm not getting your fingers, I'm just saying. But yeah, it is what it is. Ah, oh, no, 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 no. No, no. Stop. Stop. Thank you, guys. This is what we're here for. You. Thank you.